Oh, thank you. I appreciate that. Welcome. Welcome to RTP 180. Uh, so I want to tell you a quick story, just real quick. So uh, Monday, my alarm goes off at 4 a.m. And it generally never goes off at 4 a.m., but Monday was a special day. I was uh, invited to go out fishing in the Big Rock Blue Marlin Tournament. Um, I don't know if you're familiar with that. It's a big tournament off of the coast of North Carolina. And this year was a record-setting year. They, had 100, they have 177 total boats fishing, which means there's over $2 million that can be won. And so I get up at 4 a.m., go out with my dad. We get out there. I mean, beautiful water. I mean, I, if you ever get a chance to go, please do it because it, you have never seen any blue water like you can 10 miles off of the coast. I mean, we saw dolphins go by. So anyway, I tell you that to say most people bring in 650-pound fish, 400, 500-pound. The first person back to the scales with a 500-pound blue marlin or over this year won a little over $500,000. Yeah, yeah. So we get out there. You can start fishing at 9 a.m. We have about six lines out in the water behind the boat. And this is a gorgeous, beautifully designed 52-foot Viking fishing boat. If you've ever seen them lined up in Beaufort or Moorhead City waterfront, it is something special. So we're out there. Something hits one of the baits about 2 o'clock after we've been basically sitting there doing this all day. No cell phone service, which is good and bad. And we, we take turns. So there was three people that were fishing, and you each get an hour. So if something hits, you're not all sitting there. You take it. No, you take it. No, I'll take it. Okay, you fight it. So you know that if it hits within your hour, you grab the rod and you start reeling it in. Well, this guy, Jeff, starts reeling in the fish, and he's fighting it. And probably spends a good 30 minutes fighting this fish. Now, mind you, people are bringing in 400 500 pound fish. We caught a whopping 10 pound little dolphin. <laughs> now, not the flipper kind with the long uh, bill, I guess, but the, it's a mahi, so it's not flipper. But close your ears if you don't want to hear it, it did make for a tasty dinner. <laughs> but I was told uh, right before I came up here uh, that they were in the lead today for the most amount of total dolphin caught, which is about a $10,000 payout, uh, but they just got bumped a second by two ounces. Two ounces, right? I say all that to say that design, the design of those boats, the amount of money that these people spend on a fishing boat. I mean, some of these boats are $500,000, a million dollars. Fan base doesn't own one of those boats. Let me tell you right now, uh, we got invited to go out. But the, if you ever have a chance to look at these boats, they are beautiful. So, and I say all that to say design, right? Uh, something that we all can sometimes take for granted, but a lot of us in the room certainly do appreciate um, good design. And tonight, we have four fantastic people who are into all sorts of elements of design that we have the privilege of having this evening. So I will skip, because I know our first presenter I just probably killed 10 minutes of his time with my story about a 10-pound fish. I'm going to skip my intro, let Chad come up, do his spiel because he has to head out, um, and then we'll do the intro, have some fun uh, with the projector over here if you saw that. Uh, there is something in store with that. So uh, first off, I don't want to forget Libby. So we have uh, a special guest this evening who is uh, kind of live sketching, live drawing um, that you can actually watch on a live stream, the presenters this evening. Uh, so she is the lead designer of the brand team at Red Hat. Uh, so it's awesome to have her. Thank you for coming out this evening. So first up, we have Chad Parker, AIA, is the Managing Director and Principal of the Raleigh Office of Ginsler, a global design firm that focuses on shaping the built environment, impacting the everyday human experience. Chad credits 116.5, which is a very good number, of his success to hiring people smarter than him and having an awesomely supportive family. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the RTP 180 stage, Mr. Chad Parker. Right, sir. 
Libby, if you're sketching, take a few, take the love handles out of this right here. So, <laughs> all right. So this is usually about an hour long presentation, uh, 45 to an hour. We got five minutes. So the goal here is not to dive too deep, but to really kind of leave you guys with some what if statements and to get your curiosity pumping. Um, and to really start this off, I have a flashback to 1994. Uh, I'm sitting in AP Physics. My professor, Bert Hollyfield, was a retired astrophysicist with the Jet Propulsion Lab of Lockheed Martin. And uh, he goes on a tirade about uh, that when we grow up, our lives are going to be ruled by the internet, the economy will be ruled by the internet, and we will live our lives on a handheld device. We always thought he was crazy, so I'm going to channel my inner Burt Hollyfield, and I hope you enjoy it. All right, so we're talking about the impacts of the autonomous vehicle on urban development. So we're going to dive in really quick um, about a couple uh, metrics to kind of build this up. Um, in my opinion, the autonomous vehicle is the single largest impact on the built environment since the high-rise uh, construction. To that point, so 95% of our cars are sitting still all the time, or 95% of the time. Uh, so name another th asset or investment where it's okay to have a depreciating asset that's sitting still 95% of the time. 260 million cars, motorcycles, and buses, um, they're going to be obsolete pretty soon. 500 million parking spaces um, in the U.S. Guess what? That is uh, two states worth of asphalt with motionless cars on it. Doesn't make sense, does it? And before you guys go like doom and gloom, like this guy's crazy, we're not getting rid of cars, we're still gonna have them, it's just gonna be completely different. So here's where we stand. In, in 2015, we got $2.15 trillion worth of um, money, for lack of better terms, kind of controlling uh, public transportation, rental cars, taxis, and ride sharing. Fast forward 10 years, um, this overlay completely reshapes itself. And before you think I'm crazy, I'm sure most of you have iPhones. Guess what? It's not 10 years old quite yet. And that puts things in perspective. And it's going to happen quick. Because guess what? The thing that makes things happen the quickest and catalyzes the, the greatest change are two things. Social and economics. And when you have a catalyst like $2.25 trillion as a, as a catalyst, the change is going to be rapid. All right, so relative driverless cars or the autonomous vehicle, um, think about this. Uh, hopefully no one drives a truck right now, a uh, long haul truck, because that's going to go away pretty soon. They're already doing it on the West Coast. Um, our cars, they're going to move like ants. So ants have this amazing ability to move simultaneously. They move in complete unison. And when you do that, your efficiency goes absolutely through the roof. Think about how long it takes when you're six cars back at a stoplight to be able to move forward. Now, put that in perspective. Our infrastructure budget last year was $400 billion, maybe. Um, imagine that the fact that this is going to extend our current infrastructure another 15 to 20 years. Some people say 25. So imagine if we can take some of that, billions of dollars, let's just say 5% of it, and we put it back into education, we put it back into parks, and we create a better place. So just think about the power that holds within itself, let alone the fact that all the white knuckling on I-40 uh, is going to change. All right, so here's what we're getting to, the impact on the, the built environment. And uh, we're going to stay really high level. And I'm going to focus mainly on kind of uh, urban density and existing parking structures and kind of what we're doing right now. All right, so we got a lot of prime real estate taken up by either surface parking, parking decks, because guess what? We live and die by our cars. We just can't give them up. Even in urban centers, Chicago, there's parking decks everywhere. Uh, obviously, we've talked about light rail around here. Um, I personally don't think I'd love to have it. But if it doesn't come, guess what? We're going to have buses that are automated. Uh, we're going to move much more efficiently, and it's going to go back to being somewhat of a relaxing trip between Raleigh or Durham and RTP. All right, so think about how many gas stations there are um, and how many of those sit at just amazing corners. They're going to be the next uh, blockbuster. Uh, we're going to, I mean, how many mattress stores are sitting in a blockbuster right now? So that's something we're going to be looking at. <laughs> Dealerships. Uh, I, I grew up, my dad owned a Chevrolet dealership. Um, he got out at a great time. Um, that's going to change. Um, dealerships tend to cluster. So the good thing is there's probably going to open up a lot of nice land all around uh, kind of an urban corridor. 
But here's the real thing, is the efficiencies around development. So unless you're in the industry, you probably don't know this. A lot of what governs the success or failure or the viability of a project is being able to park it. Four per thousand for an office or a mixed use is roughly what they use in a suburban, sometimes urban location. We're getting down to like 2.5 per thousand. And so guess what? That's gonna be able to go down to like one per thousand or even nothing. And we have developers now that are saying, I'm not putting in parking and I'm gonna take a chance. But we still have this gap right now. Um, what do we do for the next 10 years? And so we'll talk a little bit how we convert that as well. So th think about this. What if your car drops you off at the front of your building and then it goes parks itself, either in a deck or at the perimeter of the urban center? All of a sudden, all this great space that has been occupied by cars and parking decks gets given back to the city. And then talking about this, so this is, uh, if anyone's in here developer and you're developing a parking deck right now and not allowing for a conversion uh, to another use, you're probably being short-sighted. Um, maybe not in wholesale, but y you need to be thinking about this. And be before you say you're such a futurist, none of this makes sense, this is not gonna happen for 10 to 15 years, guess what, we're doing it right now. We're doing it in Cincinnati, Ohio, uh, taking a parking deck, and guess what? It can be an amazingly beautiful office space. Um, thank you. Uh, <laughs> it's, it's coming, guys. It's gonna come. And when it does, we have to figure out how we handle some of the existing structures. So you got above grade parking uses. Means that office space, retail, hotels, industrial, that's kind of gimme stuff. That's the stuff that we're like, yeah, of course you are. You got a hotel near a, uh, I mean a parking deck near a hotel, you're gonna convert that to a hotel. You're gonna virtual parking deck to an office building. But what if you got a bad parking deck, and what if you're trying to buy some time? What if we had vertical farming in parking decks in an urban core? I mean, how awesome would that be? What if we actually gave back socially and became like uh, transient housing or became like low income homeless housing? There's a lot of things that these structures can do for us. Data centers below grade, guess what? We got a lot of below grade parking in big urban centers. Not so much here, but it's kind of dead space, and what are you gonna do with it? Well, with big data growing, um, or storage needs growing, we definitely see that being a trend for some of the below grade parking. Um, and then also, amenity space. I mean, there's the gyms, the fitness centers, you're gonna see a lot of repositioning in buildings down to the, the below grade parking. And then surface parking, this is one of our biggest opportunities. How many surface parking, little nooks and crannies do we have in, in an urban center, let alone a suburban location? And right now they can't be developed because they're not economically viable because you can't park them because either size, you can't fit an efficient deck. All of a sudden, all this potential is gonna be completely unlocked and you're gonna see a lot more um, creative infill development. And that's really the density uh, around that is really gonna shape an urban core uh, and also start impacting the suburban markets as well. Okay, so how long is this gonna take? Um, I know most people are like, it's gonna be forever. You're, I'm gonna go on my hoverboard or something like that. Um, even um, economy cars are adopting this technology at a, at a well, you can get it right now. Um, so it's just around the corner. We have some hurdles we gotta jump because right now our urban, um, our UDOs, our kind of design guidelines that we have to follow don't really take this into account. So like your parking ratios are off. Um, there's a lot of legal things. How do, you can't text and drive right now. So how are you gonna sit back and like read a book, you know, while a car drives you? But really see it somewhere with seven to 10 is where you're gonna see it take off and 10 to 12. Your world's gonna be different. You're gonna remember this little kid got up here and said, talked about Burt Hollyfield. And it's gonna be that moment that you remember because guess what? It's gonna be awesome. I hate driving. I can't stand it. Uh, think about how much time, let alone coming from Raleigh or Durham to RTP, but just even in the, the city, that you lose sitting behind the wheel. And what if, and what if that could be an awesome experience where <laughs> You can do yoga, you can lounge, you can work, you can play, um, and because it's so much more efficient, you're gonna get back 20, 30, 40 minutes to your life, spend that with your family, spend that doing something you like, it'll be much more fulfilling, and guess what? It's economically viable because the amount between the economic impact of productivity, um, savings on healthcare around automobile accidents, of which 90% are human error, um, and the just, Total economic gain of this is the fifth largest GDP in the world. So if you don't think that it has wills, sit back and enjoy the ride and put on your seatbelt. It's going to be awesome. See y'all.
All right. Uh, so if you are new, I didn't go through my spiel, but we do allow two questions at the end of each speaker. So do I have two brave volunteers to do two questions? Uh, all right. Thank you for helping me get my 10,000 steps minutes? in. All right. You were like seven and a half minutes. Oh, okay. Will there be automated biking as well? Sorry. Say, That's say kind of a again? joke of a question. Will there be automated biking as well? So I was flying because I'm uh, so worried about either being on time or going over. I left out a, a really important um, piece of this. Because of the efficiencies, we're going to get back a lot more pedestrian spaces and um, bicycle spaces and bicycle lanes. Um, I, I hate to say this. I hope we don't go automated because it's so awesome to go out there and, 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 and pedal. But who knows what that's going to hold. But you will see a lot more, um, uh, say, infrastructure and lanes dedicated to pedestrian and bicycle use. And like electric, uh, either moped or and, um, bicycle. All right, we got one over here. Hi. Um, are you taking into account Tesla and their fully auto autonomous driving, like level five driving, within the next few years, as you know, Elon has said? Uh, yes, because um, there's people like Tesla that you know stand up and make those bold statements. We're going to do X, we're going to do Y. They're the ones that are really going to drive the, the adoption rate of the other um, you know, manufacturers. Uh, Ford, Chevrolet, Toyota, all these folks, um, partly because of Tesla, partly because of where we're going, um, are, are putting enormous amounts of resources into this technology. And again, as a, as a catalyst, Tesla's leading the charge. Come on now. Good. That's it? Yes. All right. Do have a great time. Thank you, Sam. Thank you, Chad. I know you got a split, so thank you for giving us the time this evening to come out. All right, so welcome to RTP 180. Now I have a little bit of extra time. I can kind of do my normal spiel. Who's here for the first time? All right, who's returning? Look at you. That is retention. Who, okay, how about, here's one more survey question. Who came last month for the first time, thought, heck, it's so good, I'm coming next month, and is here? Three people, fantastic. <laughs> Probably shouldn't have asked that question. <laughs> no, but we are, I mean, seriously, there's about 80% of you in the room that have been here before. That's, that's awesome, so we appreciate you guys coming back. So, with that said, I won't spend a ton of time on the rules, uh, but I'll just cruise right through them. Each speaker is going to get five minutes. We're pretty loose on that time. Uh, after each speaker, as long as they didn't go 15 minutes, we'll do about two to three questions per speaker. Um, and at the end, there's hanging out. There's more drinks. Uh, just be courteous, please. This room is very hot. There is nothing on the floor. We do have a floor, but there is nothing on it. There is no ceiling, really. Um, so nothing really absorbs the sound. So if you are talking in the back corner or over here on the right, over, you know, and, you, and you think we can't hear, we can certainly hear. This room carries so much. So just be super courteous to our speakers this evening. Try not to talk to one another. Uh, if you do need to talk to each other, you can just go on to Twitter and use the hashtag RTP180 and talk back and forth that way so we can all see what you're talking about. That that would be fantastic. Uh, speaking of, please be uh, talking on Twitter. Um, I have seen a little bit of a downturn in people tweeting the hashtag RTP180, and it is something that I enjoy doing when I drive home. Probably shouldn't say that too. Uh, is going through the feed of the RTP 180 hashtag on 540, right? That's what probably everybody should do. Uh, but I do enjoy looking at like what you guys are talking about out there. All right, I think I covered everything. Did I cover everything? All right, and if you're, uh, I'm gonna just milk this a little bit uh, for one more presentation, um, but for those of you who are new, I'm gonna need about six brave volunteers, and that, that projector over there is gonna be part of it. So just be marinating if you wanna be froggy and jump up here after uh, Rob gets done. So next up we have Rob Sura, who is an award-winning industrial designer with over 25 years in product design, primarily in architectural products and systems. He designs, his designs include a revolutionary undulating ceiling fan, the first pattern inlaid laminate floor, a merchandising system for tires, and the remarkable solar energy trees 
his company offers. That is a fantastic resume. I love it. it <laughs> That's true. If you can write your own bio, you're, you're set. All right. You ready, Rob? Help me welcome Rob to the RTP 180 stage. I won't count that against your time. You won't count that? Yeah, I got that. Get an extra yeah. minute or two. Thank you. Thanks so much. You're welcome. It. I know it's a lot to handle. I'm sorry. Yeah, that's great. Thank you so very much. Again, Rob Sura with uh, Spotlight Solar. So great to be here. Thanks, Anna, for having us. Um, and by the way, when I say so great to be here, um, I do mean upstairs. So how many people are pioneers here at the frontier? Um, long commute down here, right? That's great. <laughs> Thanks for being here, bud. Great space, great environment. This every uh, month is an awesome thing to do. I uh, encourage you to stop by. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit here about uh, celebrating uh, technology with innovative design. Um, although Spotlight is not, we don't consider ourselves a tech company we're inextricably connected to solar technology because what we do is to advocate for the use of it by putting solar in places where people could see it. But I'm not gonna jump into solar right now. I'm gonna spend one quick minute here talking about something that uh, to me represents what could be an almost perfect example of the combination of technology and design. Um, the TZO lamp, and by the way, I've got one right here, so. If anybody wants to take a look at this remarkable piece of design, you're welcome to do so afterwards. The TZO lamp designed uh, 45 years ago, introduced 45 years ago, um, a revolutionary product in taking advantage of an emerging technology, halogen lighting at low voltage, driven by a low voltage driver, um, changing the way we look at a lighting product and integrating that technology into the design beautifully. Um, a, uh, a real remarkable design um, that, that in every way, shape, or form represents the purity of design and how it integrates into technology. So always something that we, should, uh, we, could, we could look at as uh, examples of great things. Um, that product was a disruptor to the traditional incandescent light. That wafer is a much larger disruptor to the way we look at energy uh, generation here. Um, it is, the, it is the, the way that we are going to move forward in energy and the adoption of uh, clean energy production. Um, what's really remarkable about that solar chip, that wafer, that PV cell, is uh, that this technology, uh, over 80 people, 80% 80 of people um, who are asked about solar say that they love it, but we've only adopted about 2% of our energy uh, usage currently using solar energy. So we have a really long way to go. Um, we're gonna get there. It's gonna be an awesome thing. Um, one of the ways that we're gonna get there is to get past the expectations of the way something looks like what we're looking at these two slides. So currently, when you introduce a raw technology, you commoditize it down to its most fundamental uh, cost and form and, and uh, its, its, its use. You end up with things that a lot of times aren't very well designed. That photograph on the left of a, uh, of an, of a freestanding solar um, cell in a commercial office park um, is uh, great that that solar technology was put where people could see it. So it was brought off of the roof and put where people could see it. So the folks that go through that environment can on a day in and day out basis um, see it and say, that's pretty cool, that's solar technology. Um, however, they put a big fence around it, said danger high voltage. So I, probably not a lot of people going, wow, that's really cool. I want to get, I want to learn more about it. I want to get close to it. Um, and then the photograph on the right there showing very traditional installation of uh, residential solar on the roof, uh, uh, putting something that you know was never initially planned to be on a roof on the roof, um, doing really, really good things, but aggravating a whole lot of homeowners associations by putting something like that up there. So um, th you know it's not the best way, as I say, to integrate uh, a progressive technology into the human experience, which is really really what good design can help things do. So um, where, where can we start to go with that? Um, the slide on the left is a good step in that direction. Um, 
what you see um, up on the, um, coming off of the edge of that roof there is a, a solar panel that was actually designed, and I know this because I know the person that designed it, it was designed to be viewed from underneath. It was designed to look elegant. It was designed to look uh, like it could be integrated well into an environment. So in that case, that solar panel is, uh, becomes a feature of that architectural element there. Um, and then on the right, and let's see how many of us can mention Elon Musk or Tesla tonight. So on the right is uh, the, the, the Tesla solar roof. So this is another step in the direction of uh, taking advantage of good design and integrating a technology into our human, our normal human experience. Um, the upper one uh, image is uh, showing a very clean contemporary design. The lower image, something very, mu very much more traditional. But in uh, both those cases, the technology is integrated better into um, into that architectural environment. Um, great saying that uh, Elon Musk had when he when he was introducing all of this is that you know he said yeah I, you know I'm gonna be at the end of the street and somebody walks by and I'm gonna like grab that guy and go hey man look at my sweet roof you know haven't heard that before that's typically not something that you're gonna hear from somebody but it's pride in what you're doing with the technology and adapting something that is good for all of us um, but we think that you can go even further with that and how do we want to do that? Well, we think that we should celebrate a technology. And we are in the business of bringing solar off of the roof, putting it where people exist, where people gather, where people walk, where people talk, and invite people and encourage people to be curious about it, want to know more about it, interact with it, and experience it. As I said earlier, we are not a tech company, so those solar modules that are on the top are very, very good looking solar panels, but uh, that is not the whole story. That's just part of the story. The rest of the story is what's happening below those modules and how um, people experience that product. We really believe that uh, to be an advocate of solar technology is to give people an opportunity to experience it, to ask questions about it, to want to learn more about it, and have a positive experience with that. So we're changing expectations, really, with what people would normally assume is a technology that they either may not know much about or they have a preconception that it is maybe not something I want to look at. Some things that are done as part of a design process that really comes to the heart of how we can add value to that technology um, listed a few things here that we can talk through really quickly that talk about that. So one of the first things that we do with something is to consider the human element in interacting with this technology. Humanize the technology itself. Um, well, you saw the picture earlier, the danger high voltage. That was a pretty easy thing to do first. Let's get rid of the fence and the danger high voltage sign. That, 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 that helps humanize that technology. But uh, even beyond that, um, it's, it's creating an, an inviting uh, uh, environment for people to come into, invite curiosity, a shape or a form or, or, or an environment that from a distance, it's kind of like, what am I looking at out there? I think it, it's reflecting a little bit. It looks a little bit different. It's got a character that's, that's kind of unique and interesting. Um, oh, you get closer, it may, that's, that looks like a solar module. I've seen those before. That's pretty cool. And you get even closer to that, and you're looking up at it, and you're looking around at it, and you start to think, there's some really interesting things going on here. I think I'm interested in, in uh, learning more about this. Um, you're enhancing that, that human experience that, that we have with uh, that technology by inviting and creating those interesting things around it. Um, the um, enhanced experience, the opportunity is to add more to that. What does solar do? It creates energy. What can you do with that energy? Well, you can charge a phone. You could charge an electric vehicle. You could do other things with it. So take advantage of what the curiosity is bringing and start to do other things with that. Um, and then take it even a step further, and you could actually create uh, a brand, distinguish that product and that solution, uh, and create a family of things that uh, have, similar, uh, have similar experience with it. So we'll show you some pictures here of some of the ways that we've done that with our product lines. And, um, the, the, 
first uh, sh image on the left there, um, fundamentally creating shade and shelter. That's, uh, it's an easy thing to do with these panels overhead. Um, add to that shade and shelter a, uh, a feature that makes the solar, which is working by day in the sun, but what about at nighttime? Well, there's lights in that that illuminate the underside of that structure. So at nighttime, that solar structure is useful. There it is, more added value, added benefit to the product itself. Visibility and co-location, um, creating a, a visible solar structure that is inviting curiosity and putting it next to an electric vehicle charge station. That's a, a great opportunity to draw people to that, uh, that location and create an association in their heads that if I'm charging my car, my electric vehicle at that location, and I'm looking up at that solar structure that, that inevitably some of those electrons that are being generated from there could be coming into my car itself. That's a good thing, too. And then um, lastly, but maybe even more importantly, uh, most importantly here, too, is that the structures themselves, it's a both personal and social experience. You can go up to it and, like I said earlier, maybe charge your phone at that, too, but also it's a gathering place where People get together, let's meet at this particular place. So if the, if the social interaction is encouraged and enhanced by these products themselves, then we've gained our value in that. So um, to that point of value, I said earlier that solar commoditized itself very, very quickly, and it sold, and it is sold traditionally in a dollars per watt perspective. How cheap can the product be to get as much energy production as I can get out of it? By adding value to the product solution, by taking into consideration all of the things that we've been talking about with. Uh, with, with, with the human interaction with the product itself and adding other things to it, the product all of a sudden has great additional value. I mentioned earlier, with reference to this TZO lamp, uh, 1972, um, commanded 20x price at the time, and still, it's about a $400 lamp. There's any number of lamps that you could buy a whole lot less expensive than that, but the good design maintains its value, and people are willing to pay for that because of what they're getting out of it. Uh, the same with what we're doing with this, these products right here. These are not products that are valued in how many watts of energy they produce, although that's what they do. They are valued at what they offer to those that interact with it, those that live in front of it, those that work in the environment around it, those that interact with it on a day in, day, day in and day out basis. Okay, so I talked about solar. That was cool, interesting, I hope, maybe not, never know. Um, let's bring that back to another product or, or another emerging technology that I think is interesting from just purely a really straight ahead, matching the technology with the design itself. Um, keyless entry systems or wireless entry systems, sometimes they're one and the same now at this point. Um, a couple of design attributes we can kind of quiz ourselves as to what we think is happening with these things. Early, early versions of it on the left where the technology is force fit into a, into a form or a shape that was perfectly good for when it was a normal keyed entry system in a traditional looking house, but uh, clunky, not really, not really comfortable, not really very um, attractive. Second example is where you take technology and you change the product itself, a door handle, to be more dominated by the technology than the door handle. It may not work great as a door handle, it's not very inviting to touch and feel, but it can say hi to you on your way in and out the door and tell you what the temperature is outside. Well, I'm not really sure that's the best way to handle that. Design integration of that final um, product there is where we're really starting to see maybe some useful things going. All the benefits of the technology of keyless and wireless, uh, uh, wireless control, entry, and security of the system itself. Elegant design, efficient communication via nonverbal techniques to understand what it does and how it's working. Um, something that you want to interact with when you open and close those doors every day um, and effectively get the benefits of that, that, that uh, technology and that value. So um, I'd like to wrap this up with just a very quick image, one more time, of something that uh, Spotlight Solar is doing. And uh, we're celebrating technology and we think that the design uh, of that is a critical part of, uh, of that experience. So thank you very much for the opportunity to speak very quickly with all of you here. Appreciate it. Thanks.
All right. Two questions. Oh, that is bright. Uh, two questions, and then uh, for those are, who are live streaming, uh, if you ask a question, I'll give it an extra second because there is a little bit of delay. I'll look to Ryan on that. So if you have something live stream-wise, you have a question, we'll make sure we get it this time. We missed one from the first one. Two questions. Anybody? Yes, okay. You two right here. Who wants to go first? Okay. Um, so one of the tools that I know Google is rolling out right now is a feature that allows you to see the building that you're in, or any building really, uh, the amount of sun exposure that it receives, and whether or not it might be a practical uh, idea for someone or a business or a residence to install solar technology. Um, in terms of a day-to-day -day user, maybe someone who doesn't run a company or has a lot of capital at their disposal to install a system like that, how could that feature, being able to see, here's my given sun exposure in my house or my apartment, how could you translate that into uh, integrating solar into your day-to-day -day life? Uh, so if you would, just one more time, uh, tell me what the technology is that you're ref referring to? Sure. So it's a, a new feature on Google. I think they rolled it out in San Francisco and Boston, kind of the big tech hubs for now. Mm -hmm. um, and you basically put in your address or the address of a building, and it will show you how much sun exposure you get throughout the day um, and where okay. it might be best. Yeah. 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 Um, so um, I, clearly advantageous to have an opportunity to, if you do not know what the opportunity is with um, solar production based on the orientation of your home and the uh, amount of squ the square footage of roof available for that. Um, something like that is a, it's a good indicator of whether or not you're positioned. So I'll use a very fundamental example. If you have a home that's oriented, let's say more north-south than east-west, and you have sloping roof that is fully east or fully west, um, you may want to have more work, more studies done, more accurate studies done to that, um, that location to determine what the potential is for power generation on that non, let's call it a non-optimized slope of the roof. So I think it's a good tool to kind of give you a hint as to where you might be going in that direction, but ultimately the opportunity would be for a local solar integrator to come by, take a look. I mean, you have things like tree, you know, tree cover and shade that you're going to get at different times of the year that will impact it as well. So, you know, I think it's, it's a good way to get people to start thinking about things like that, but I think that ultimately to go to those people that that's what they do is really the best way to, you know, the best way to understand that. Sure, go ahead. Great. Um, I love the designs. I've seen it uh, around the city, so uh, thanks for the beautiful designs. Thank you. Um, how do you convince your clients or the organizations to incorporate design into their solutions because design is more of the intangibles, right? And it's really hard to calculate the ROI. Uh, but once, they, once it's out there, people see it and, and they experience the ROI. But up front, how do you convince people to do that? Um, marketing. <laughs> um, we, we've taken, we've, we've spent a lot of time, made a lot of effort to communicate the value proposition of our product line against a traditional perception of lowest cost production of solar, you know, uh, the dollar per watt syndrome. So what we need to do is to communicate that added value, communicate image value, communicate return on, in, on, on investment from the perspective of the, the, the reputation value that is gained from this. A very simple solution, or a very simple um, way to look at that is a um, convention center has a megawatt of solar produce, production on its roof that absolutely nobody could see, nobody knows it's there. The value of putting something like our product in front of that facility means that in a day in and in a day out basis, those multi-million, the, the number of people that are going through there, over a million people um, a year, um, will walk past that, back and forth from that, 
understand that that thing represents something that's going on that is interesting, and we then need to, that, that thing becomes part of that value prop equation. So it's very important for us from a marketing um, and communications perspective is to help those end users understand what they're getting from that that is above and beyond that fundamental investment into the product itself. Thank you so much. Steal half of that back from you. All right. So I've warned you about this projector, and I need six volunteers. I'm going to first try to get six new people every time we try to kind of initiate new folks here. It's probably why they don't come back. <laughs> but I want to try to get six people. Come on, six people. Six. Okay, we got one. There's our first brave soul. Thank you. Brand new. Brand new. We probably won't see you next month then. <laughs> How many more? Jacob, you want to do it? No? Okay. You, all right, we got two, three, four. We need, we need two more. Two more. Five. All right, you, sir, six. Okay. So what we're going to do is we're going to play Pictionary. So I need you to break up into teams of two. Even if you don't know somebody, just break up into teams of two. And there's one more coming. I thought there's, you sir, you stood up. Somebody, somebody come up, doesn't matter. All right, while y'all break up, and what I need you to do is figure out, out of the two people on each team, figure out who is the better drawer of the two. So converse while I set this up. All right, all right, bring it back in, bring it back in. So teams of two, who's the better drawer? You? All right, I need you to draw. Okay, who's the better drawer? All right, I need you to draw. Who's the better? You said you were better? Okay, I need you to draw. All right, my drawers, come over here. Okay, so this is going to be a timed effort. So your, your partner there, right? Okay, I'm going to give you up to a minute. I'm going to whisper in your ear something I need you to draw, and you have to try to guess it within a minute. Okay, the team that guesses it the fastest, they're all going to be different, but if you guess it the fastest, you win. All right. you win what? Uh, congratulations. All right. In three, two, one, go. Banana. Banana? That's, yep, you got banana, right? Oh, that's a good guess. <laughs> You're close. <laughs> you have banana, you have car. No. All right, I'm going to give you like 15 more seconds. Okay, all right, that, I got, I, that's, an, that's an amazing monkey, but it was, a banana, it was a monkey holding a banana driving a car. You came close. You can't. I told you you guys wouldn't be back next month. You gotta make it hard. All right, team number two. I need some, okay, you're drawing, okay. Uh, all right, let's make sure there's a, Okay, are you ready? Set, draw. It's a face, it's a boat, it's a boat, sailboat.
No, if, unless you want to lose. Oh, boy. Come on, buddy, keep guessing, just throw it out. Now you lost me and I told you what it was. Okay, listen to the audio. I heard pirate, so listen there. Listen, pirate. Clever, but no. On a There you go. A pirate holding a sword on a boat. All right. All right. Yay. Okay. Up. Oh, all right. You're you're up? Okay. All right, here we go. He's got it. Ready, set, go. Oh, you got to stand off to the side. We can't. We can't see. Yep. Yes. Well, I'll give it to you. Tornadoes and, yeah, a shark inside of a tornado. Sharknado. Uh, all right. Thank you all for playing. Uh, do we have shirts? or Yeah, we have some shirts. You all get, get shirts. So um, either Anna will pass them out now or we can do it later. Either way. Uh, let me move this back and then we'll, we'll get Lenny up here. Thank you all again. That was fun. Yeah, so believe it or not, uh, my neighbor actually had that projector. She's a mural artist, so she uses that to project the drawings. <laughs> All right, so I actually, uh, when I, before I moved back down here from Indiana, um, I was on Twitter kind of doing some research about who was in the area, and I actually came across this monkey-looking character uh, and it was Hey Monkey Design, which ended up being Lenny. So I've known Lenny uh, for a few years now. We've done some projects together. Uh, he's got a screen print shop. He's got a design shop. He basically does just about everything I think you can think of when it comes to design. He's a keynote speaker at huge conferences. Uh, but his official bio reads like this. He runs Hey! Exclamation point, Monkey, a one-man branding, illustration, and screen printing shop right here in Dur Durham, North Carolina. Lenny also serves on the board of the AIGA Raleigh, the Professional Association for Design, as vice president, and has a passion, uh, and I can attest to this, for nurturing creative communities. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Lenny Terenzi. I had to look at it for a second. <laughs> you have the clicker? I do, somewhere. There it is. All right, clicker. How y'all doing? I told you I have that boomy voice. Yeah. Hello, ladies. Oh, that's me. All right, so I am here. Uh, hello. Uh, I am here to talk about branding. So I'm going to kind of be the, the touchy-feely uh, segment after all the awesome, way smarter than me tech talk uh, that just came. I'm going to do the fun, touchy-feely stuff. Uh, big thanks real quick to Will and Anna for having me out here. Uh, I appreciate it. Uh, so, like we said, my name is Lenny Terenzi. I am a designer, illustrator, screen printer, community builder. I do it under the name Hey Monkey. Uh, a lot of people ask me, I'm a design shop of one, why is my shop called Hey Monkey? Uh, and she is actually here with me today. This is my daughter, Bella. And the first two words I said to her when she was born, I held her in my arms and I said, Hey Monkey. Uh, and so when I decided to name my business, that's what I went with. Uh, so that is, that is the, reason, the reason for the season right there. Uh, so we're going to talk about some branding today and, and what branding is, right? So, you know, what the hell is branding? And just any designers in the room, I promise I know how to kern. This is, this is Microsoft PowerPoint at its best right here. So I'm just letting you know that that ain't me. If y'all ever do decide to hire me, I will kern your stuff. So anyway, 
Uh, I just had to count that out because Microsoft needs to call Apple. Anyway, uh, so branding, it's not your logo. Not at all. It's not your logo. It's not your colors. It's not your typefaces. It's not that pretty brand style guide that you guys all have to, you know, send out to everyone anytime somebody wants to lose your, uh, you know, use your brand on something, right? It's not visual. It's not really what people can see, uh, you know, what, you know, for what your brand is. Uh, yeah, it, really, it's all that visual stuff. Uh, you know, Paul Rand said it best. It's the silent ambassador. Um, everything needs to come before that. The picture is easy, right? Brand is, is how you make people feel. It's the interaction that you have with your clients, uh, with your customers. It's uh, how they feel when they've come off a phone call, when they've walked into your business, your shop, whatever. Uh, most importantly, if, uh, if they've had a bad experience, uh, it's how you handle that experience to them, right? That is what builds your brand and what is, is what puts you out there in a good light to people. It's how you make people feel. Right, uh, it's a promise. You know, when when you when you, when you're setting up a company, a business, uh, whatever, you're making a promise to somebody. You're making a promise to customers, to clients. You're making a promise to your employees, uh, to your family. Uh, you know, so you want to make sure you know that 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 pr that, that promise uh, holds true, right? So you know, if if you're gonna go into this for the sole purpose of making money, and yes, I understand we have to make money. We want to make money. Love me some money. Um, you get, you're going to fall short, right? You want to design your product or company or culture. If you do that for monetization first and people second, neither of them are going to happen, right? So what the hell is this process? How do we actually get that to happen? So we've kind of talked about the why a little bit of the brand. And now we want to talk about like, you know, a quick shot of the process. Sorry, so trying to distill the last 25 years of my career into the next 120 seconds. Um, you know, for the process of branding, right? Again, PowerPoint. What in the hell <laughs> is that? Does Bill Gates still have anything to do with him? Anybody got him on speed dial? Um, you want to do it right, okay? When you're getting ready to engage in, in either uh, creating your brand for the first time or overhauling it, you know, doing a redesign, if you're not ready, to feel like this several times throughout that branding process, you need to really evaluate why you're doing and what you're doing in your company, right? Because you gotta get ready to do a deep dive. You've gotta get ready to get uncomfortable. Uh, if you have an internal creative team and you're the boss, guess what? You need to try to make them the boss during this process. Instead of them answering to you, you should answer to them and kind of give up that control and kind of let things go for a little bit, right? So, you know, if you're not ready to do this, if you're not ready to kind of get your hands dirty, um, you need to kind of figure out a way that you can kind of separate yourself, uh, you know, from that process so you can do that, so you can feel uncomfortable. Um, because if, if you end up just kind of mailing it in, you're not gonna stand the test of time, right? It's gonna go away really quickly. And you wanna be able to have that solid foundation, something that you can leave, you know, hopefully for your children and generations to come. What you want is this. You want everybody around you, from your employees, to your mom, to your dad, to your daughter, to the, to the people that are gonna be interacting with you to be excited, right? You wanna instill passion in everybody, right? This is my spirit animal. Right here, right here. Yeah! Right? You want, all these, you want, you want everyone that interacts with you, from you to your family to your customers, to head out feeling that passion uh, you know, for your brand. Um, I know, right? And that's just, God, look at him, ready, ready? Dun, 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 dun. I don't know, anyway. <laughs> because it, the beauty of it too is, is, is it something that you don't have to do once and be done or do once and go, uh-oh, we've changed. Because uh, the, the greatest thing about a, a great brand is it's a story that's never completely finished. If you're doing it right, if you're bringing in the right people and you're creating the right culture, it's an ongoing story. Um, and that's what's really the most exciting about it for me uh, as a designer is being able to help you tell those stories, um, but also uh, helping you open up to you know, reevaluating that story and help, helping you find maybe what the story is now. Uh, but most importantly, what your story might be in five or ten years to try to be a little bit of a future teller for you. 
Um, so I really appreciate you guys listening to me real quick for my little touchy-feely talk on branding. Uh, would love to, to hear from you guys if you're, you know, want to talk more about it. Um, I do have to run after this. Uh, my daughter's in a mentorship program, and tonight's the, the closing of it, so we got to skedaddle over there, there and do a whole bunch of stuff. But I really appreciate your time. I uh, appreciate you guys coming out to this. Love seeing this kind of community and everything here. So uh, thanks so much, and I think a couple questions, and if, if there are any, thank you so much. Any questions? Or just so yell my name. Is that a question? A uh, that's cool too. Or, okay. All right. So that counts as one. Anybody else? <laughs> are, are there key questions that you ask the team in order to figure out how to create the branding? Yeah, so uh, the way I do it is, uh, you know, there's, there's that kind of that term that's getting thrown about now, especially like in healthcare and stuff like that, gamification, you know, where you're kind of turning something into a game or into a progress path for people to feel like there's a process. And I try to do that with my clients when I'm starting out uh, doing stuff. So we sit down and we play like card games, like brand deck games that have words and things of, you know, how do you see your brand? How do you feel your clients see your brand? So we're playing card games. We're doing word association. We do color games. So I don't really ask questions. I just kind of sit and try to kind of disconnect them from that kind of that regular, let's sit in a boardroom and, and stare each other down and just ask a list of questions. I just try to kind of make it a little more interactive um, and try to just organically pull information out of them because uh, everybody's different. And if you kind of let them think they're in control, think they actually aren't, I still am, I'm still driving the car, you, you get a much more uh, honest and natural uh, you know, reaction and, and where you need to go. One more? Got time for one more? Or you can just say my name again. That's cool, too. <laughs> yes. <laughs> That's all right. How would you handle the design versus the funding? How would I handle the design versus the funding? Can, can you elaborate? What do you mean by that? Actually, if you don't mind elaborating on that for me, just a little bit. You design based on the funding you have. How do you handle that? Oh, okay, so like in terms of like if a client comes to me and says they have X number of dollars, that what you're talking about? And how do I go from there? Um, so I've been doing this for a little while, so obviously I kind of have, you know, where I know what I need to charge and, you know, to be able to make what I need to make to survive. But then with that also comes people who have amazing stories without amazing budgets. Um, and, I, right, and, and I'm kind of at a point in my career now, you know, I'm, I'm successful, I'm not like swimming in it, um, where I've learned how to scale what I can give them versus the, you know, the budget that they have. Um, you know, so I have done a branding project for, you know, a piece of pie and a couple hundred bucks, and I've done a branding project that, you know, is upwards of $15,000. Um, and it's just learning how to scale and find the needs of, of, of what they need to, you know, to get them going. So. Um, you know, if there was a while that I said, you know, if, it, if it's not $5,000 budget, I won't do the project. But I've kind of learned that uh, some of my favorite projects, honestly, have been the $500 ones. Um, but I, you just, I've learned how to put in the appropriate amount of time. So that's kind of how I deal with the sliding scale of budgets. Awesome. Thank you very much, guys. Appreciate it. All right, uh, make sure this is on. Hold on. Oh, I forgot his booming voice. Hold on, I gotta, gotta. There we go. All right. So uh, normally, I tell a joke or two, and somebody tweeted that it just wasn't the same without one. So I appreciate that, and thank you too for all the people that were concerned uh, that I tweet and drive. Um, Appreciate that, too. Uh, I really don't do that. I was just kidding. My mom sometimes watches the live stream, so I got to say that. <sighs> you guys doing all right? Doing good? Okay, so let's hear that joke, and then Julietta will bring you up. How about that? All right. Uh, it has nothing to do with design. I tried to des uh, Google corny design jokes and nothing really quite came up uh, that I thought was quite interesting. 
Um, there are a few, uh, but they're all more visual. But uh, what did the duck say to the bartender after ordering a drink? <laughs> all right. You, <laughs> so put it on my bill. Um, put, put it on my bill. Yeah, yeah, someone else was Googling corny jokes, too. <laughs> All right. Well, okay, how many, uh, let's see, how many tickles does it take to make an octopus laugh? <laughs> I'm bombing. I'm bombing. They're going to start throwing tomatoes. Let's bring you up before I just keep digging a giant hole. All right, Julietta Shirk is a landscape architect licensed in North Carolina and is an associate professor teaching landscape architecture and design at North Carolina State University. Any wolf pack? All right, you got a few. You got a few. Anybody taking her class right now? One? Oh, good friends. Okay. Uh, in the, so she is an associate professor at North Carolina State University in the departments of horticultural science and landscape architecture. Along with her students, she focuses on improving socio-cultural and natural resources and designing living infrastructure such as bioretention structures, green roofs, edible and or ornamental landscapes. I went to ECU, so I apologize. This is these are these are big. These are big. No, I'm just kidding. My wife hates when I make fun of myself. I have two degrees from there. Okay, landscapes that provide co-benefits in the life of communities. Are you ready? I hope so. I hope you are so ready. I think you've given my talk. <laughs> I gave your talk? Well, you, it was your bio. You don't have okay. to worry about that. We're being very no. lenient. Okay, all right. Well, I put my timer because I, I want to be uh, efficient with the five-minute uh, limit. Um, so these today, this week is the last week of uh, first summer session, during which I have taught one study abroad course to Oaxaca, Mexico, where you see me standing there in the pyramids at Montalban, um, and two courses in the landscape architecture department, um, the plant identification and planting design courses. And so if I act a little like a zombie. I am exhausted. We are, um, we have our final for one class tomorrow morning and then the other for uh, the second class on, on Monday. But um, when I was invited to do this talk, I, I was really excited. I thought, well, you know, talking to non-designers, how many designers are out there? Just a few. Well, I would argue that you're all designers. Um, and what's really cool about um, landscape architecture um, we're Renaissance people. We, we look at a whole spectrum and that really long, boring bio um, sort of uh, spoke to that. But what's really wonderful about design, I feel like every one of you in this room has the power to bring delight and health into your life with design. Um, and I hope I'll inspire you just by showing you some of the things I do in my in my day-to-day -day work. Um, yeah, you heard that. So a little background about me. Um, as you see in the globe up here, I love Google Earth. My father was from Monterey, Mexico. My mother is from Venezuela. What a disaster Venezuela is right now. Um, and how did we end up in Raleigh, North Carolina? Well, my father fought in World War II and um, came back with the GI Bill and got a master's in uh, industrial uh, engineering from Georgia Tech. From there, because he was Hispanic and spoke Spanish, he was sent to Latin America. One of his first places was Venezuela, where he met, not my mom, but her sister. <laughs> he was madly in love with my mom's sister. Well, she was already in love with someone else and would have nothing to do with him. Thankfully, my mom, who was away in Connecticut at boarding school, came home for Christmas and at a dance met my dad. And that's how it came together. So what's really cool about that is that um, Daddy worked all over the world. Um, when we were young, he sort of drug us all over Latin America. 
Um, and as we got older, we had to settle. And eventually, he worked in textiles for a long time. So we ended up in, in North Carolina. Um, but I was raised in a home where people came from Nepal, Russia, Japan, Spain, Brazil. So we, th we just thought of ourselves as global citizens. Uh, my father felt that way. Um, so we, 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 we felt like we were from everywhere. Um, and then we spent our summers at my grandmother's house. So I want to just show you that because I, it has been a great influence in, I think, who I am. So in Venezuela, Cagua is right about an hour outside of Caracas. And it's set up in a grid you know, uh, situation like most colonial towns with the big plaza downtown in the center. And right here is my grandmother's house. That house is um, divided into a, a uh, it's a whole sort of block. So there's a street here and here. And in the middle of the courtyard is what I learned in design school, a paradise garden. So little did I know when I was a little girl, when you walk in this door here, and this was the first thing that greeted you, this bench with the garden, that I grew up in a paradise garden, um, which has its roots back in, in Islamic culture, where um, you know, they, they enclose gardens to keep moisture in. Um, my son, who is my um, best design, I think, is right here. So he spent a lot of time with me in, in Venezuela and I think was also influenced by it. Um, you see these downspouts in the rainy season, the water pours out and this big gush of water comes out. And both Walker and I enjoyed putting on our bathing suits and playing at, at these, in these gardens and in these water spouts um, that were probably not meant to do that. But in any event, um, just to finish up, Venezuela, um, when I was a, a baby, uh, I'm one of six children. So I was sort of neglected in the middle. <laughs> um, and so my mother tells me that when I would get vo wake up from my nap and no one would come get me, they would find me in the garden eating the rotten guavas off the ground. And I said, oh, that's nice. <laughs> So I, I, I just think I have, you know, gardens and fruit and, and all those things sort of as a part of, uh, you know, the core of who I am. Um, I'm also, as an adult, connecting to my culture in Mexico. I, I mentioned the study abroad. Um, and this is the little town where I was born, where my parents, my father worked in a jeans um, factory. Um, anyway, uh, I just wanted to point out, again, the central square with this beautiful bandstand that is actually used. People go out there on Thursdays. I know we're talking about technology and design, but um, these very simple human spaces um, that are part of communities and, and human scale streetscapes. So I can't wait till we get rid of all those cars, have beautiful solar power, and brand our cities with um, human scale spaces and shops and, and experiences um, that are much healthier for us. Um, I just wanted to throw in influences. Um, of course, you, some of you may know who this is. Does anybody know that? Olmsted, Olmsted very good. Um, he is the founder of the profession of landscape architecture um, and was actually a, a, in the health care business to start with. So from the very start, our, our profession has talked about how our green spaces can be healthy for us. And these two gentlemen um, were uh, men our mentors uh, that I did an internship with in Caracas. Um, but more, a little more about that later. So I'm trained as a landscape architect. I have a master's in landscape architecture. So teaching is a whole different animal. But thankfully, the idea of teaching in landscape design, um, it fits beautifully with the design process. And some of my colleague speakers here mentioned the design process, where you use critical and creative thinking to go through the process of discovery and making decisions about how to synthesize what you've discovered from your clients, from the place, et cetera. Um, and then 
rethinking it and coming back to it. And that's what I think is so beautiful about design, um, that it pushes our creative and critical thinking to its maximum. And that's the foundation of what I've used for my teaching. Um, so I teach everything. I teach in the horticultural science department, um, where um, I and another professor um, teach things. So I do everything from hand graphics to digital graphics, um, grading and drainage. Thank God for my father's good engineering brain. Um, so landscape design, landscape architecture is at the sort of crux between art and science. So we need to understand a lot of things about a lot of things. Um, but we also have the opportunity to be artists. Um, and thankfully, my brain is kind of wired like that. Um, inevi inevitably, I think we're all sort of destined to be what, we're, what we were wired uh, to do. So I work with my students to solve problems as they learn their if, you know, new skills. We apply them to real world uh, um, projects like this little project at NC State solving some stormwater issues and, and, and combining it with people spaces. Um, these classes that I teach, I try to infuse with working with communities. So um, I'm just gonna flip through lots of opportunities that I've had with my students to work with communities. In this case, we solved um, an issue with um, uh, steam pipes underneath the garden at NC State. Um, we figured out how to make this little sandwich uh, detail here. So innovative idea of creating a, you know, separating the growing space from the hot pipes underneath. Um, so the students actually designed it, built it, um, and you see it right here in the corner, the final product. Um, we did get an award for that and were featured in Landscape Ar Architecture Magazine. So proud of that. Um, also proud of my work abroad. I'm, I'm still trying to develop uh, more programs to take students abroad. In this case, it was a, a five-week program where uh, students from Veracruz University and NC State worked together to solve urban issues. Um, that was quite an amazing experience. Um, and then the, I was just mentioning, I just got back from doing a, a project or a, a class, a study abroad class with 12 students in the city of Oaxaca and in uh, Puerto Escondido, which is at the coast of the state of Oaxaca. Um, where we really got to know uh, people um, di that dye wool and spin wool and use natural products. They actually taught our students how to weave. Um, we just had an extraordinary experience meeting people, um, finding out how much they were like us and, and, and so forth. So a really growing experience for the students and myself. Um, my appointment is 100% teaching, but NC, at NC State, we are expected and enjoy doing research, teaching, and extension. So with my graduate students, I get to dive into a little bit more information. In this case, uh, with um, Junyen, we worked on uh, evaluating spaces and asking people where they felt comfortable or not comfortable. Um, I'm just gonna flip through some of the, the research that I've done. Um, another student and I evaluated uh, residential spaces and how using sustainable practices can inform the aesthetics of those spaces. Um, so trying to promote, promote more sustainable practices. Um, another student was interested in street trees. So again, my profession is very broad and um, we sort of cover everything. So we discovered that trees that were replaced every seven years only had a short period of time where they were um, at their optimum. But the ones where we spend a little more money and, and had a longer period of time for them to be optimum, um, you know, tended to do over time were perhaps less expensive. So things like this that we share with the communities, and that's what we talk about extent, uh, extension and sharing what we find out in our research. The latest research I worked on was uh, 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 evaluating 10 green roofs in the research triangle. We looked at the vegetation and we looked at the um, way the things, the roofs were maintained. Um, and we discovered, 
oh, that slide looks funny. But we discovered that many of, some of them had a lot of bare ground shown in blue here, um, while some others had a lot of uh, vegetated, desirable vegetation versus undesirable, which means weeds. Um, weeds love green roofs. <laughs> So we discovered that, and we were thinking that we could advocate for just growing weeds on the roof. Um, but then we identified some plant specific plant material that we, we have already shared in extension articles, and this is getting ready to be also published in a journal. Um, and simple lessons, little lessons from our research uh, with my graduate students from the, that particular study, just simple things like protection from wind, with solar panels um, and, and allowing light, but also using other things, um, using the appropriate amount of organic matter, pre-planted packs, using rails instead of harnesses. We were up on those roofs, 90 degrees, with those heavy harnesses locking in. It's a safety uh, system. Um, so things like that, watering and when watering only when necessary, um, controlling weeds with inorganic uh, mulches, um, and then making really good choices about the types of plants that you put up there that will thrive in our hot, humid summer nights. So a lot of detail information. Um, and finally, I just wanted to show some projects I've done throughout the state. Here was one in Oxford um, that I worked with my students, um, Wilder Arboretum in Nightdale, um, Manio at, at the, uh, at the uh, Elizabethan Gardens. Uh, a really awesome project that we did in Kinston. Um, this is on NC State. The students evaluated how the skateboarders used the space and looked about, you know, thinking about uh, plant uh, choices for a, sort of a challenging area. An art piece in Chapel Hill where we collaborated with a, an arch landscape architect. We grew bulbs for the, um, for the uh, North Carolina Museum of Art, uh, Art in Bloom event. Um, we started in September and precisely grew them with the help of Dr. Uh, August de, de Hertog to, and there's Dr. De Hertog the day of the installation. With his help, we were able to force allium, which have never been forced before, and get them to bloom specifically for three days in April. Let me tell you, we had a lot of sleepless nights. Dr. De Hertog was pretty confident, but he, he always teased me because he says, he says, if the plants are ready. And I said, no, 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 when? Um, but it was a huge success, and we we're very proud of the, of the, of the work done uh, for the art museum for that very short period of time. Um, so a little bit more of my students working with um, the veterans at the NCAPA, just down the street from here, um, developing their memorial garden. Uh, which was just built uh, using some of the student ideas and, and help. Um, we, I team with Carla Delcom, a colleague of mine, to do things in the summer, like this little space uh, for a, a preschool in downtown Raleigh. Um, and currently, if you're not busy on uh, Monday at 1 o'clock, come to the College of Design. And my students went to the coast and are designing a little uh, space here at the um, UNC Coastal Studies Institute, uh, where we've got the privilege of solving some issues like um, eroding, uh, you know, water edges, um, and connecting people through this Greenway Trail. Um, I hope to leave August 1st to head out on a Fulbright experience to teach in Mexico the things that I love, landscape architecture, but mostly training students how to work with communities. So you saw all that work that we did. Um, a big piece of it is how to get students trained sort of in non-traditional way um, of educating designers to really understand how to uh, collaborate with communities. And um, I just wanted uh, to end with um, beauty is at the core of our emotions. Um, and we are hardwired. Uh, for, for beauty, inferring that beautiful environments can sustain life and primal needs. Um, and I thank you for your attention. All right. Real quick, time for two. Real quick, two questions. 
Come on. Go party. Anybody on live stream? Well, like no questions or no one's watching on the live stream? No, people are watching. Oh, people are, well, how many people? 30? 40? 1,000? Five. Five? Okay, so this might be a good time to tell you, if you can't make it, we do live stream these every time. So we'd love to see those numbers continue to grow, but we certainly would love to have you here. All right, two questions going once. Okay, gotcha, right here. What do you think is the impact or difference in growing up in a paradise garden versus what many of us have, which is just a green backyard, or sometimes it's brown? Oh, boy. You know, I, I, I grew up in Gastonia um, here in, in North Carolina, but spent my summers with my grandmother there. Um, I, I think you can, you know, enjoy the delights of nature anywhere. Um, hopefully you h maybe didn't have a paradise garden, but you were close to a park or even a little potted plant, um, just watching them grow and change. Um, so I think all of us have been informed in that. And again, I think from our primal beginnings, we're wired to love. In fact, there's research that proves that uh, when shown images, people prefer landscapes with blue water and birds and plant material. So don't worry if you didn't grow up in the Paradise Garden. You're wired for it. <laughs> All right, one last quick one before we call it a night. Yes, ma'am. Here we go, front center. I'm curious how you pick projects for your students. Great question. So I practice prior to teaching. So I'm sort of connected with a community of my colleagues. Um, and they know that I do work mostly with disadvantaged communities. Um, or communities that wouldn't ordinarily be uh, hiring a landscape architect. Um, so that's how I, uh, that's the criteria I use to choose the projects. But there is many people calling our department, um, you know, looking for some support in design. So thank you. Thank you so much. I'll just steal the microphone from you. Thank you so much. Just don't forget your phone. All right. Okay, so two quick announcements. Um, if you, by the way, I think I forgot this, but if you've never been to the Frontier Building before, this is kind of a open co-working area during the day. Uh, with that said, July 3rd and 4th, it will be closed. Um, so just a heads up there. And then next month is bio, I could probably look on the back of the shirt, but <laughs> biomedical engineering, something I excel in. All right. So I do have some t-shirts. Uh, I will try not to hit anybody. I think somebody brought a baby, so heads up. Um, I do have, I mean, sure, yeah. That was probably the least enthused t-shirt toss in the entire world. You already have one? Well then keep, to oh yeah, you won. Keep to toss it back. All right, toss it forward. Okay, I'm gonna try. There's a bunch of rafters, so I'm gonna try to get it up and right in the rafter. Okay.